Good morning, everybody. So um, before we get started today talking about electronic spectroscopy, we have um, one residual question to talk about from the exam last time, which is this thing where we had a molecule in the C C4V point group. And a couple of people asked me some questions about how do you know which reflection plane is the vertical plane and which one is the dihedral plane. So remember, in general, the dihedral plane, I guess it's not, it, it bisects perpendicular C2 axes. But, so that's the definition of it in general. But that doesn't make sense in this point group, right? Because there's only one C2 axis. So the question was, how do you know which one is vertical and which one is dihedral? And I spent a lot of time looking at this. I looked at a lot of books and I talked to some other chemists. And I have concluded that it's completely arbitrary and it doesn't matter. So it's, and it's interesting because almost every character table I could find does list it as sigma V and sigma D, but Nobody has a good reason for which one you call sigma v and which one you call sigma d. And if you go through the answer with, with it assigned the other way, you get a different d orbital being involved in bonding. And after reading some stuff, I also concluded that there's no spectroscopic experiment that can tell you the difference between those two d orbitals. And so it doesn't matter. So if you put this the other way on the exam, that is equally correct. So here's how we're going to do this. We, the, the exams have been sent to be scanned. Somebody has to scan them all and send them back to you. I'm not sure how long it'll take them. I'm glad it's not my job. I mean, the, you know, they, on, during midterms, they get everybody's exam there. So when you get your exam back, check it out on the PDF. And if you lost points for doing that, send me an email with your name and ID number. You don't need to send me your PDF. I'm already going to have it. And again, please wait until I definitely have the PDFs because I'm going to go look at them. I'll give them to you as soon as, as you get them, and I will change your, your score if you put that. So that was interesting. I learned something. So remember, in this, uh, in this particular point group, that distinction doesn't make any sense, and it's kind of arbitrary. Does anybody have any more questions about that? All right, let's move on. Just need a second to switch to my laptop. Okay, so now we're moving on to electronic spectroscopy. This is chapter 11 in your book. And remember our big picture here. So we talked about the difference between rotations and vibrations, and then now we're getting into electronic states. And all of these things are on different energy scales. So it doesn't take very much energy to excite the rotational states. And then if we put in a little bit more energy, we can excite vibrational states. And the difference in energy between those two is really large. You know, so rotational transitions take about, they're about one wave number, and vibrational transitions are 100 to 1,000 times more. So basically, at room temperature, there's all kinds of population in the rotational states, you know, as we saw from those plots of, of what that looks like. But most molecules are in the ground vibrational state, and they're also mostly in the ground electronic state. So now we're going to look at what happens if we put in a lot of energy and excite the electronic states. So again, here's what that structure looks like. So we've got the vibrational levels within each electronic state. Notice they're all evenly spaced because we're using the harmonic os oscillator approximation. That's not true for the rigid rotor states. And so again, as we saw with um, vibrational spectroscopy, when we excite those high energy transitions, we get all the lower ones coming along with it. 
So these things are more energetic. And you'll definitely see fine structure from the, from the vibrational states in your electronic spectra. But you might not necessarily see fine structure from the rotational states. In fact, you usually won't, just because we don't have infinite resolution. So if you could zoom in forever, you would see them. But a lot of times, you, you don't have the resolution. Sometimes you might not even have the resolution to see the, the vibrational states. It depends on the molecule. OK, so before we get into um, talking about this in more of a quantitative way, I want to go over some conceptual things. So let's talk about what happens to excited states. So we get really hung up in PCHEM about talking about things like fluorescence. So we excite a molecule to an excited electronic state. And then you know, we think about, OK, there's a transition back down. But if that happened most of the time, then everything would fluoresce all the time. You know, it would be like the uh, vampires in twilight glowing in the sunlight, you know, because you're, you're getting UV radiation and, and everything is fluorescing all the time. And that doesn't happen. So clearly, there are a lot of uh, other ways to get rid of energy from excited states. OK, so one important one is non-radiative decay. So that's just heat. So you can get something in an excited state, and then the energy just goes from there into molecular translations, vibrations, and rotations. So this is something that's really important in the, the crystalline proteins, which are the structural proteins in our eye lenses. These proteins have four tryptophans in the, the core of the fold. And it seems like you wouldn't want tryptophan in your eye lens proteins, right? Because this is a really good chromophore for UV. It absorbs the UV. And it seems like that would be problematic because you're absorbing all this energy from UV light that could damage the protein. But it turns out that this is really efficiently quenched. It's coupled to backbone vibrations. So the UV light comes in, and then the tryptophans are coupled to these motions of the backbone, and the protein just moves around and maybe heats up a little bit, and nothing happens. That prevents it from undergoing any sort of more damaging <coughs> transitions that, that would damage it. Um, Another thing that's interesting about that is that some aquatic species, like the, the box jellyfish that we're, we're looking at in my lab, don't have any tryptophans in their islands, crystallines. Some do, some fish do, but you know, the, some of these proteins have evolved differently for the aquatic environment where they're already protected from UV light. So that's one way you can get rid of this extra energy. Another one is just dissociation. You kick that molecule up into an excited vibration state, and it vibrates and vibrates, and then it gets over the, the rim of that anharmonic potential, and it just flies apart. So here's a, here's a picture of that, a molecule dissociating. And those green atoms are just flying apart. So that is totally an option. You can, you can zap a molecule with, with light and have, it, uh, have some bonds get broken. Photochemistry it does happen. OK, so then let's talk about the ones that are more familiar in this context, but less so in, in, uh, in life. So if we get fluorescence, that's what happens when we irradiate the sample with light of some wavelength, and then we get emission of light at a longer wavelength. So a lot of the things that we typically see we'll be irradiating something with UV, and then we observe visible light coming back out. So this, this example is cells that are stained with green fluorescent protein and uh, different variants of it that, that give different colors. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, because I think it's really neat. But um, the thing about fluorescence is that it happens on a nanosecond time scale. It's really fast. So if you take... Uh, your fluorescent sample out of the light source, you're not going to see any more fluorescence right away. Um, if anybody has a, a black light or access to you know, a UV light box for visualizing gels, a lot of food dyes are really intensely fluorescent. So um, look at a bowl of Fruit Loops under UV light. It's kind of terrifying. <laughs> 
if I can find a UV light I can bring in and you know, I'll have to see if I can do that. Um, there's also phosphorescence. This is radiation of a longer wavelength being emitted after an electronic state is excited, but it takes longer. So things like glow-in-the-dark stars where you have to, uh, absorb, you ha you have to uh, expose it to the light, it absorbs, and then over time it's emitting light. So glow-in-the-dark stars work by this mechanism, but not glow sticks, that's chemiluminescence. Okay, so that's a little bit of a, a general idea of what happens to energy after stuff gets excited. And of course, in the spectroscopy context, the first two cases aren't all that exciting. So just dissipating energy to heat is you know, one of the more common things that happens, but chemically it's not all that interesting to measure. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about fluorescence and phosphorescence. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, you know, what's actually going on in some of these transitions and why, you know, why we're able to observe things like colors. So if we look at hydrated copper sulfate, and it's, it's hydrated just because there are waters present in the crystal structure, it has this really nice intense blue color. And that's because of its electronic properties. So if we look at this, it absorbs in the visible region because of D to D transitions in the complex. And so here's its absorption spectrum. And so if you look at this, you notice that, um, you know, the spectrum of visible light is plotted down here. You notice that it has essentially no absorption in the blue region. And then as we get into the yellow and the red, it absorbs relatively strongly. Of course, its main absorption is, um, you know, at longer, wavelength, but, you know, so, so in the uh, IR, but we can't see that. All right, so remember the color wheel from, you know, elementary school art class. We see the complementary color to what's absorbed. So in this case, it absorbs a bunch on the sort of yellow, red, orange kind of the spectrum, and so we see this nice intense blue color. And this is something that I'm going to come back to because what, we're, what we observe and the answers that we come up with in these, these scientific contexts really depend on our instruments. So if we're looking at something with our, our eyes, we get kind of a backwards representation of what the thing is really about. So we're seeing blue, but really what's happening is that it's absorbing more orange. And so it might make sense to, to, to talk about this thing in terms of its absorption spectrum in instead of in terms of the color that we observe. And that might sound really trivial, except that sometimes it can really affect our observations and our, our perceptions of what's really going on. And so we always have to keep in mind that we're not directly observing reality. We're observing whatever our experimental apparatus, which could include our own senses or it could include an instrument that we built. We're observing what that apparatus is set up to tell us. And we always have to remember that sometimes we have to relate our measurement back to the question that we actually want to answer. And I will talk about this a little bit more. OK, so let's keep talking about the copper, the copper sulfate case. So what do we mean by D to D transitions? So in a free atom, all the D orbitals have the same energy. So these are the, the blue ones in the, the third row, right? So we know in our atom just out in space minding its own business, all of these things have the same energy. So transitions between them wouldn't really be relevant. But in a D metal complex where we have something where the d orbitals are involved in bonding, the degeneracy is broken. And this is something that you know from looking at the character table. So if we have an octahedral complex here, you know, I just picked this example, you can go look at the character table for the octahedral point group, and you'll see that not all the d orbitals belong to the same symmetry species. They don't all have the same energy. And so that means that we can get transitions between them. And it happens that in the case of an octahedral molecule, that transition energy happens to be in the visible range. And so that causes the, the compound to absorb, and so we're able to see a color. A lot of compounds, like a lot of common organic molecules, <coughs> absorb in other places in the spectrum, like, say, in the UV, and so we can't see them. 
But of course, that doesn't mean they don't absorb radiation. And if we go and measure that with a spectrometer, we'll see it. Let's talk about an organic chromophore that does absorb light and that is strongly colored. A lot of plant pigments have strong absorption in the visible region. So here are some, the spectra of some pigments from, from plants. We have a couple different kinds of chlorophyll and also some carotenoids. So these things have some common properties. A lot of, you'll see a lot of organic chromophores are highly unsaturated, they and they, a lot of times they have conjugated double bonds. That's because having that conjugated double bond structure shifts the absorption into the visible so that we can see it. So we'll, we'll see that in a lot of uh, chromophores that, that we can see. Another feature of them that you'll notice is a lot of times the molecules are very flat. They have a very rigid structure. So like this porphyrin structure that you know, has the magnesium in the middle, it's a big flat ring. You see that in a lot of plant pigments and there are things like that in other chromophores. The reason why it has that structure is because it's so flat and rigid that it can't easily just dump that excess energy to bond vibrations. It, you know, it just doesn't have that many ways to move. And so that's why we see these, uh, these electronic transitions. In this case, it's usually from the, you know, the pi to pi star molecular orbital in the double bonds. And it's shifting in the visible light so we can see it. So again, you know, here's what I'm, what I'm talking about, about missing the point of these biological pigments if we're talking about its function. So we see chlorophyll as being green, but in fact, you know, to a plant, it's, it's red and blue, right? It's absorbing the, the red and blue ends of the spectrum, and that's what it's enabling to, to use the, the energy. So if you try to grow green plants under green light, they're not going to do so well. Carotenoids, on the other hand, are absorbing more in the high energy region of the spectrum. So they're absorbing blue. We see them as orange and red. In the biological context, those are acting as sunscreen. So they are just absorbing uh, UV light and it's uh, protecting the, the leaf from sun damage. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about those. Let's quickly talk about absorption spectroscopy in a little bit more quantitative way. And this is something that I know everybody has seen in general chemistry lab and probably other places too, where you use a spectrophotometer to measure the absorption of some compound. And this is done using the Beer-Lambert law or Beer's law. And Beer's law relates transmitted intensity at some frequency. It's only defined for a particular frequency. It's related to the path length and the concentration of the sample. And so obviously this is really useful in a spectroscopic context because you know the path length, you set up the instrument, and you can use this to determine the concentration of samples if you know their absorption, or, or conversely, you can use it to find out their absorption characteristics if you know how much of the molecule you have. In my lab, we express proteins, and so we use this all the time. We, we use it to find protein concentration. Okay, so our I here is the transmitted intensity. And remember, it's transmitted. That means that we're looking through the sample. So we have something that's transparent. We're shining light through it and looking at what comes out the other side. I naught is the input intensity of the light that's coming from the spectrometer. And then it has this functional form. Epsilon here is your molar absorption coefficient for the, the uh, molecule of interest. Sometimes you can, you can calculate this. Um, certainly for proteins, there are some estimates that, that you can use depending on its amino acid composition. It's been measured for many molecules. If you have a brand new molecule, you have to measure it yourself. Um, also, don't confuse it with the quantum number epsilon for electronic transitions. And this, uh, this thing, the absorption coefficient, is in centimeter squared per mole, basically. So it's you know, area per, per um, mole of, of compound. And then here, J is your concentration of whatever species it is. And L is the path length. 
So this is pretty straightforward. I know that you've, uh, you've all probably used it before in general chemistry. We're just going to go into a little bit more detail about the, the mechanisms behind it and how it actually works. Um, I should also point out that you can, you can put this in terms of absorption. And if you want to look at the absorption band spread over a whole bunch of uh, different frequencies, so like in the case of those plant pigments that I showed you, they don't just have one really sharp, well-defined peak. They have a big blob spread over a bunch of frequencies. And in that case, you have to integrate over that whole frequency range to, to get a, a realistic measure of the absorption band. OK, so again, this is, this is a review. But it is useful. It's something that, that comes up a lot experimentally. OK, so getting back to the idea of how what we see depends on our instrumentation, I want to point out again that here we're talking about transmitted light. We're looking at a, at a transparent sample and seeing the, the color through it. There are other ways to get colors. So there are also structural pigments. So this is like what you see in lots of places in nature, actually. So here's a really pretty iridescent beetle. You also see it in a lot of birds. So like hummingbird feathers are really strongly iridescent. Um, various fish, lots of things have structural colors. And what these things are usually doing is using something called a quarter wave stack or a Bragg stack. And that just makes use of the properties of light when it hits uh, changes in refractive index. So if, if it's going through interfaces where, you're, where you've got high to low refractive index and the stacks in between, the, the uh, layers in between are arranged in increments of a quarter of the wavelength of light, then it gets reflected right back out. So this, this quarter wave stack makes a really high quality reflector that's specific for a fairly narrow range of wavelengths. So in this case of the bug, it's green. That's not because it has green pigment. It's because it has these little stacks of air and chitin in the, the carapace of the insect that is acting as a, as a Bragg stack. And so one way to tell that you're looking at interference colors is if the color changes in your perception as you change the angle. So if you're, if you're holding the thing and the color changes depending on how you look at it, that tells you that you're probably looking at interference colors. And in that case, if you took you know, the bug carapace and looked at the transmitted light through it, you wouldn't see very much. In, in order to get uh, an idea of the, the color properties of it, you have to take the reflectance spectrum instead. Um, I put this picture of an, an oil droplet and you know, with constructive and destructive interference here to point out that that's essentially the same effect. We're just looking at constructive and destructive interference of light uh, on this, this thin surface. OK, so let's talk about our measurement device when we're thinking about just, just looking at, at these things and observing the colors. Basically, everything that comes in and out of our cells, including information, is carried by a membrane protein. So all of our, our sensors, as we're going through life, involve particular detectors that are usually G-protein coupled receptors. And we have all kinds of, of different ones. So there are photoreceptors. We've been talking about vision. There are also mechanoreceptors. There are actually different mechanoreceptors for just touch in general, feel, you know, feeling light pressure and feeling pain and damage, those are called nociceptors. Um, we have thermoreceptors. Other animals have some senses that we don't have. So for instance, a lot of fish, including sharks, have electric field receptors. Another thing that has those is the, uh, the platypus. So the snout of the platypus actually contains a bunch of electric field receptors. And they feed by going around and snuffling through the, the mud on, on the, uh, the bottom of, of rivers and, and, get, and eating small crustaceans there that they, that they find with these electric field sensors. So here's how these things work. We have, uh, they're usually this, this bundle of seven transmembrane helices if it's a G-protein coupled receptor. And something on the outside of the cell 
impacts it, you know, so either binding in a chemical sense or in the case of uh, the visual system absorbing a photon. And then that, that induces some conformational change in the protein, which is here the, uh, the red things. And that conformational change activates some kind of a signal on the other side of the membrane, and the signal goes on and all sorts of information is transmitted. And it's just a good thing to be aware of. So I don't expect you to know any details about this right now, but it's, it's uh, interesting to talk about because this is our instrumentation that we're using when we're observing things around us. And also it's really relevant in a scientific context. So one of the Nobel Prizes that was given last year was for solving the structure of G protein coupled receptors. Of course, this is still a, a major frontier. There aren't, there aren't very many of them solved. And in a lot of cases, it's quite mysterious how they actually work. OK, so getting back to the specific case of the eye and how we perceive light and color, we have um, two different kinds of receptors in our eye. There are what are called rod and cone cells. And the rods contain rhodopsin which is a, a G protein coupled receptor that is not color sensitive, so it doesn't have any particular wavelength sensitivity, it just enable, it, but it just enables us to see photons. So that's what we're using for dark vision, and that's why we don't see colors very well at night. In the rod cells, those are the ones that do have color receptors. So there are three kinds of these receptors in most humans. Some people have mutations in one or the other of them, and that causes them to be colorblind. But most people have three, and your eye integrates what you're seeing in terms of color by measuring a ratio of how many photons are being absorbed by each kind of receptor. And that's also interesting when we think about what different animals do, because some animals have a lot more of these than we do and they're able to see a larger range of colors. So a lot of insects can see way into the UV. A lot of birds can also. The, the greatest number of these I've ever seen is in the mantis shrimp. It has something like 16 different pigment receptor, different color receptors. So its vision must be uh, pretty interesting. It's got a lot of gradations in color. So, I mean, that, uh, of course, the more of these you have, the larger the, the spectral range you can cover, but also the, the finer the distinction in color you can see. Um, here's what the absorption spectra of our visual pigments looks like. So we have three of these, these receptors for color. They're essentially in the red, green, and blue uh, parts of the spectrum, but again, you actually perceive the color because your brain takes information about how many photons are being absorbed by each type of pigment and then integrates that and gives you back your perception as, as a color. And if we look at rhodopsin, which is the nonspecific one, that's right in the middle of the spectrum. OK, so here's what rhodopsin looks like. So here's our seven transmembrane helices that are shown in yellow. And the blue and, and red uh, thing that it's stuck in is the membrane. That's the membrane of a rod cell. And in the middle of rhodopsin, it has this chromophore called retinal that is mostly one of these conjugated, it's, it is one of these conjugated systems. And the bonds are mostly trans, so we have this long straight molecule. But there's one double bond that's in a cis configuration. And what happens is when, when that rhodopsin molecule absorbs a photon, the double bond isomerizes. It goes to trans. And so if you look at this molecule, you can imagine that that causes a really big conformational change. It was kind of bent like this, and now it's straight, and it's jammed into the middle of the protein. So when it does that, the whole protein has to move around. All those helices shift around, and that causes a signal on the other side of the membrane. And so I'm not going to get into all the uh, details here, but if you look at the the structures of the, the chromophore as it gets extended, that gives you an idea of how that uh, moves the protein around and, and causes a signal. OK, so you know why is it interesting to talk about this? So as scientists, we really have to be concerned about making sure that 
we know what we're looking at and that what we measure with our instruments, in this, in this example, our eyes, is really relevant to the natural phenomenon that we're studying. And that can be easy to mess up, even for people who are trained in doing science. So here's an example where that happened. So these little birds are called blue tits. And they all look the same, right? They're just these little blue and yellow birds. They're kind of cute. There were some biologists who were studying these guys and trying to figure out how they choose their mates and what their behavior is based on. And they had drawn conclusions based on what the birds look like to us, either blue and yellow. And a lot of them look pretty similar, but they were thinking, OK, well, some of these, these differences in markings are not that important to us, but they're really salient to the birds. And so that's how they're choosing mates. And there were various papers on this. And then somebody thought to look at the reflectance spectra of these things outside the human visual range. And it turns out that on their heads, particularly in the male birds, they have these bright markings in the UV region of the spectrum. And so that's what the birds were actually looking at when they're responding to different individuals of their species. So these biologists did some experiments then where they put sunscreen on the birds' heads. So that blocks the UV. And the female birds couldn't see the markings on the male's heads. And that totally changed their behavior as far as how they were choosing mates. So it turns out that the birds look completely different to each other than they do to the humans observing them, because the relevant thing is markings in a region of the spectrum that we can't measure with the instruments that we are using. And so the people who were studying this you know, figured out that, that this is what's going on and came up with um, one of my favorite paper titles of all time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the moral of the story is we have to remember what our experiments are measuring, even if we're just making observations with our eyes. You know, we can get really hung up on everything must be the way we see it. But in fact, when we're talking about things like vision and perception, there are a lot of different things going on, and that's true of, of uh, all kinds of these physical chemistry phenomena. And we want to always make sure that we remember what we're really measuring versus what it is we want to see. OK, so that's the sort of conceptual big picture introduction to why we care about electronic spectroscopy. Does anybody have any questions about that you know, or about random biofacts or whatever before we move on to, uh, to talking about it more quantitatively? Yes. So I don't know that much about that particular bug species. I'm guessing probably camouflage. You know, so instead, of, but just instead of having pigment, it has this interference color. That's, you know, that's how, that's how it's making this color. You know, with these structural layers. In some other species that I know more about, like cephalopods, they can. That's how they actually change color. So they have these um, chromatophores that they can move different, you know, different amounts you know, up and down closer to the skin. And that I think there's a mixture of pigment and structural colors there, and they can actually change it and move it around. But yeah, in the case of the bug, I don't know exactly what it's doing. I would guess camouflage. Yes? Yeah, the, the cones also do have different chromophores. I don't remember exactly what they are, but they do, they do have uh, different chromophores that are related. They look, they look similar. They might just be the same retinol, but they might be modified a little bit. I know um, in, in some animals, the retinol is definitely modified. So diurnal geckos are the only thing that I know of that can actually see color at night. So their rods are adapted so that they're actually working. They're, sorry, their cones are, are actually adapted so that they're working all the time. And I know that they have a modified retinal, but I don't know if that's specific to the gecko or if, if everything does. Yeah? Uh, the way you're talking about the cephalopods and how they're changing color with the iridescent layers, is that the same way that chameleons change color? That's an interesting question. I don't know how chameleons change color. I'll have to look it up. Um, 
So there are, there are two mechanisms that I can imagine. So one is that. You have this, this uh, reflective layer that, that is getting moved around. The other one is if you have actual cells containing a bunch of, of pigment, and that is actually getting shuffled up and down. Or you know, So I'm not sure which it is in that case. But it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I actually I work on some things related to this in, in my lab. but. Uh, you know, mostly I'm a physical chemist, but, but it's always interesting to find out things about, you know, how the PCAM concepts relate to stuff in nature. Okay, so let's move on and start talking about uh, electronic spectroscopy a little bit more <coughs> quantitatively. So we're back to talking about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And we looked at this before in the context of, of vibrational and rotational spectroscopy. And I'm bringing it back again because it's relevant. So what we're assuming here is that the probability of uh, electronic transitions is going to depend on the positions of the nuclei. But basically, the motions, of the, the motions of the electrons are so fast that it takes a while for the nuclei to catch up. So, if we're, so what that means is if we're looking at the equilibrium positions of the nuclei, the electronic states might have more or less overlap depending on that position. And then when we excite something into an excited electronic state, it might take a while for, you know, it might, it might take a finite amount of time for that uh, molecule to start vibrating in response to the electronic transition. So basically all we're saying with the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is that these things happen on very different time scales. You know, that doesn't mean that we don't excite vibrational states when we undergo an, an electronic transition. We do, but it's not instantaneous. And definitely one thing that happens is that uh, the probability of the electronic states depends on the nuclei. And we'll see what that, what that looks like when we show some pictures. So we'll have you know, vibrational states where there could be a perfectly good transition there, except that the electronic states don't overlap very much. OK. So here's an example of that. So here's the, um, the spectrum of iodine, I2. So this has a lot going on, and, and we'll, we'll come back to this probably a number of times as we're talking about different aspects of electronic spectroscopy. But right now, what I want you to pay attention to is we have these different states in the electronic spectrum. So we've got the ground state, which is called X. And it has this anharmonic potential well. And there are all kinds of uh, vibrational states within it. Notice they're not evenly spaced because we have an anharmonic potential. And then. If we want to jump up to that next uh, electronic state, notice that their potentials are not exactly overlapped in the internuclear coordinate. So I should point out the y-axis is energy. The x-axis is separation between the nuclei. And so what we see is that um, excited state is, you know, it's kind of uh, at its lowest potential at a different internuclear distance than the ground state. And so as a result of that, their potentials don't overlap as much as they might. And so there is going to be some uh, transition between these states, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily going to be very high. In this particular case, we do get plenty of overlap, but you can easily imagine stuff where you just don't see any transitions because the internuclear distance has to be so different in order to, to get the, the molecule up there that it doesn't uh, happen in practice. OK, let's talk about some more terminology in terms of this picture. So we've got the electronic states and the vibrational states drawn in there. So again, nu is the vibrational quantum number, just, just like it was uh, previously when we talked about this. Nu with a tilde is the vibrational frequency. And if it has a tilde, that means it's in wave numbers. 
Um, yeah, it's weird to have uh, frequencies in wave numbers. Welcome to spectroscopy. We don't get to pick the notation. It's just there. D naught in this picture is the dissociation energy. So that is the energy at which you have so much vibrational energy in there that the molecule just flies apart. And remember, we, I, we talked about this before when I showed the enharmonic potentials. And I said, OK, you don't need to know about this so much right now. Now the time has come. We're going to talk about it in more detail. So here's our dissociation energy. DE is the equilibrium dissociation energy. And so <clears throat> that's, we're, here we're talking about the difference between measuring to the ground state of the vibrational wave function or the bottom of the potential well. And they're different things. And then we've got Te prime, which is the electronic energy. There is also an, an anharmonicity constant, which is your correction to the potential. That's, that's how your potential is deviating from a harmonic oscillator potential. And notice that that has a tilde over it, so it's in wave numbers. And then we also have uh, our convergence limit, which is, um, you know, that's, that's what we get into it in the higher energy states. And I think I'm going to quit here for today. I just wanted to introduce the terminology, and we're going to talk about it in a lot more detail next time. <laughs>